Hello, 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 and welcome to Journaling with Jesus is Live. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, 10 seconds late. Not sure how this thing works. A lot of the time it says live, and then when I go back and look at it, I'm like halfway through talking and it cuts me off. So hoping that this works tonight. Um, I'm going to wait until a few people pop on. I see that one has joined us, and um, even though I, I want you to know, even though I see one has joined, I can never see who you are. Uh, when I see that people have joined, it just gives me a number. So if you are here, I would love for you to say hi in the chat section, uh, just to let me know that you are here. Hello, Tiffany. You are live. Yes, I know. <laughs> I can see that now that I am live and it's it's so weird because it gives me this right it gives me this screen in front of me that shows me my picture or you know shows me um my image and I get a little distracted by that not gonna lie hello Melissa hello hello friend I am so glad that you are here um again if you are just joining I would love to know that you are here and that you are joining if you want to remain anonymous too that's cool I totally appreciate that um but if you would like to say hi I would love to hear from you that you are here. Um, tonight we have a pretty packed um, night. Hello, Tammy. So glad that you could join in. I know that it's been a while, I think, since you were able to join in on a live. And again, I am hoping that this works. The last two times that I have done a live, I have got and shut down uh, either a quarter of the way through or halfway through and I've had to restart so I'm really hoping that we get through this from start to finish tonight without anything uh, disrupting us like weather or just you know my daughter calling in that happened one time I sent her a note earlier and I'm like do not call mama between this time and this time right so hopefully nothing will disturb us tonight um, I would love to know my question I usually start out with a question um, I would love to know this. Now, if you watched, um, if you were on the Journaling with Jesus page earlier, I had posted a picture of myself with my Bible and my journal and my pen and a cup of hot coffee that I had made for myself this afternoon. Um, I would love to know what is it that is your favorite fall um, snack, right? So on Instagram today, I took a little poll on my Instagram and asked people to tell me what is their favorite afternoon snack. And I would love to know what is your favorite fall snack? What is your favorite fall go-to drink? Is it pumpkin spice? Do you like pumpkin spice? Do you like chai latte? Do you like, um, you know, uh, maybe a uh, apples? Do you like caramel? What is it that you like for a fall treat? Listen, I'm just trying to get some um, advice over here and get some uh, opinions so I can change up my game a little bit. It's fall. All the comfort foods are coming out and I am all about it. So um, I would just like you to respond there in the side chat if you would. Uh, tonight we, hello Dawn, hello, 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 so good to see you. Uh, I know that um, you haven't been able to be with us at our journal nights and I have missed you. So it is so good that you are joining us tonight and you've joined at a really good time. Tonight's going to be a really good live, I feel like. Um, I've got a lot of good things, I think, planned uh, for tonight. So um, London Fog Tea. Interesting. I would like to know more about that. High tea, uh, I'm sorry, hot tea and cinnamon toast, I think. TST, does that mean toast? I'm thinking that that's what that means. Caramel latte is my favorite drink no matter the time of year. Yes, girlfriend, I'm all about the cinnamon and the nutmeg and the pumpkin spice all throughout the year, right? So I am with you. It doesn't need to be fall, um, but it does give us a an excuse, right, to get all cozied up. I've got a long sleeve on today. I've been outside um, most of the day today studying, and so it's been a fantastic day. I love the, the, the cooler temperatures. We just are getting home from California. We visited my daughter and my son-in-law out there for the last, we were out there for nine, nine or 10 days. And uh, the fires are still blazing out there. The, the um, 
air quality is really, really poor. The sky is just this funky orange color. And so um, hot, hot, hot days. I think we had the highest day that we had there in temperatures was 111. So I was really, really happy to get back and see that we were in our 70s uh, in the in the uh, in the weather condition here in Elkhart. So oh yes, um, Melissa says oh yes, chai latte. London Fog is steamed milk and Earl Grey tea. I'm all about that. That's awesome. I would, I'm going to write these suggestions down so that I have some things that I can try. Um, uh, yeah, Dawn, I've missed you too. Yep, not this month, maybe next month. I, I totally get it. There has been some craziness going on in everybody's schedule. Everybody is busy, so I totally get it. Um, but I am so glad that you could join us tonight. I'm so, so glad for all of you that are able to tune in tonight and so good to see you. Um, this is a great alternative, right, for not being able to meet in person. Even though I can't see you, it does help to have the interaction on the side and it does feel a little bit like we are all in a giant room together having Bible study together. So awesome. I hope that you have your Bibles with you. I hope you have your journals and a pen. I hope you have something nice and warm beside you to drink or maybe water even. Um, you know, I went on and on about getting yourself a beverage of choice and then I didn't even bring anything with me tonight. So um, hopefully I won't have like a coughing attack or anything because I don't really have anything to drink tonight. Um, but I did drink three cups of coffee today so I think I have reached my plateau with what I can tolerate in caffeine today so um, we are gonna get started um, we are gonna be in mark chapter 8 tonight I have sort of a message slash study slash just a whole bunch of things that I just want to share with you tonight if I could um, oh mom says finally it took me a while to get to you my darn phone I am so glad that you are here though so um, I'm glad that it worked out. See, you didn't miss anything. We are just getting started six and a half minutes in. So you are totally good. Um, we're going to be in Mark 8 uh, to start off our night. And again, I feel like, um, <laughs> you know, I, I my husband and I have been talking about um, starting this, well, continuing on with my YouTube channel. Now, I had started a YouTube channel years and years ago when we first developed Inspire Ministries, and I kind of used it as a platform to kind of talk about events and things that we had coming up. I'd never really used it for a teaching platform or a Bible study platform of any kind. And we were kind of in the midst of talking about what does that look like? What do regular regular um, videos look like, what does content look like, and I have an entire um, journal that I have dedicated to all of my ideas of um, messages and Bible studies that I want to do. Um, and so it's interesting that whenever we sit down and we talk about kind of like our plan and what we want to do and how we want to roll it out and what kind of content we want to have, I always say, Content is never the issue. I always have more than enough to say. Um, the problem is, is getting it all configured correctly in my head and then narrowing it down to one or two things to say per video. Um, because I always feel like I have so much to say. Now, I haven't done a live in a couple weeks. And like I said earlier, if you were with us, um, my last two lives got completely shut down halfway through. So I'm praying that this that doesn't happen this time. But when that happens and, they've, and I go a couple weeks in between doing the live videos. I feel like I have so much to say in a very condensed time frame. And so I apologize if these tend to be longer. Um, I, I, my hope always is, is that they roughly stay around the hour mark. I love the engagement that we get and the conversation that we have and the, and the kind of the way that you guys throw questions in. I love that so much. The problem is I always have so much that I want to say. And sometimes I feel like I'm just like, you know, spewing it out left and right and that nothing is really making sense. So I'm really prayerful tonight that what I am going to say tonight will be helpful, will be inspirational, and will help you um, in your journey. Um, I'm hoping that some of the things that we will discuss that I will talk about tonight um, will actually be something that you can carry on throughout the rest of your week, chew on and digest and think about and those kinds of things. So um, 
So we are going to start out um, in Mark. A couple things that I want to talk about um, tonight. And you know, I feel like since we've been doing these lives, I think we've been doing them since mid-April, um, we, we've been in this pandemic situation. Ever since we've started these, we have been in this pandemic. And so a lot of the messages and a lot of the studies that we have done have kind of circled around this idea of crisis. And... Um, and, and I feel like every time, it doesn't matter if that's what I plan on talking about, it always comes back to that. And so, um, so and tonight is really no different. And um, there's just so much going on in our world. There's just so much happening around us. And it's hard, it's really hard to, um, to be living in in the times that we're living in right now, right? Uh, it's just very, very difficult. And when I was out in California, just in our traveling, I had a lot of time to think and a lot of time to really process kind of what's happening and 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 uh, and all of that. And so we're going to kind of talk about that tonight. But I want to start out in Mark chapter eight, and I'm going to read a story that I feel like um, is kind of the place that I want to start tonight. And and I want to preface all of this by saying. Um, asking kind of the, a question, asking a couple questions. The first one would be, can we see Jesus now? Can we see him in our midst? Can we see him working in our, our lives, in our situation, in the current world condition? Can we even find Jesus? Um, are, are we looking for him? Are we keeping our eyes open for Jesus in the midst of of crisis in the midst of chaos. And I want to, there's a couple stories in the Bible that I want to talk about, but again, we're going to start out in Mark chapter eight. And I want to read this story. Um, and in my Bible, in the NLT, in my section of this particular passage of scripture, it says the yeast of Pharisees and Sadducees is how this is labeled. And in here is this um, story of Jesus warning the disciples for the dullness of their hearts, the condition of their hearts, the dullness of, of, um, of how they were perceiving their, their situation. Um, and I, I want to start out by saying this, this kind of, this, this story comes at the tail end of a conversation that he had with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were a group of people um, who, who were, who were argumentative towards Jesus, who were, um, who who always tested Jesus, who didn't believe that he was who he said he was. And we find him doing, we find this happening to Jesus in chapter 8, verses 11 through verse 13. It says, and I'm just going to start out reading in verse 11, it says, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had arrived, they came and started to argue with him, testing him and demanded that they show them or him show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. When he'd heard this, he sighed deeply in his spirit. And he said, why do these people keep demanding a miraculous sign? He said, I tell you the truth. I will not give this generation such a sign. So you can see this, this heavy sigh, this heavy burden that Jesus had about these Pharisees who demanded a sign. Now remember, these people, these Pharisees, up to this point had been privy to all sorts of miracle workings of Jesus. They had already um, experienced so many miraculous signs. They'd already seen and been a witness to so much. They had been there um, during the angelic hosts that celebrated Jesus's birth. Um, they, they had been there during the reception by Simeon and the response of Anna in the temple. They had been a witness to the star in the east and the magi following the star of gifts to the newborn baby Jesus. Um, they had been privy to an audible voice from heaven at Jesus' baptism. So they had already been a part at some level to all of the miracles that Jesus had performed up to that point of all of the miracles that had taken place surrounding the life of Christ up to this point, And still they were demanding a sign. Now at some point, you know, 
I could, even in reading this, I could see myself in this story. Um, so many of, so much of the time, so much of, of so many times in my life, I have been at that point where I am asking God for a sign. Like, God, I know this is you. I feel like this is you. But if you would prove it by giving me a sign. I don't know if many of you have been like that before, if you've found yourself saying that or not. I know for sure that in my life, when I have doubted or when I have um, misjudged a situation or when I have gotten completely out of um, connection with the Lord, I find myself saying that, hey, God, I know I feel like this is you. I feel like, you know, um, this is what you would have me to do, but I need you to show me a sign. And yet, how many times have I been a witness to the miracle work of Jesus in my own life? So we're going to go on. I just wanted to set it up. That is what's happening. We're at the tail end of that particular thing happening, that particular conversation happening between the Pharisees who are demanding a sign. Hey, hey if you are the son of man, if you are who you you will do X, Y, Z. They were putting conditions on their belief in the Savior. And then um, we see then Jesus responding and saying, I don't know how much more you want to see. I will not give this, idolat um, this idolatrous generation this kind of sign. So then we're going to pick up the story. And this is kind of where I want to pick up for... Um, the night together, um, as we begin this night together, I want to start out in verse 14 and read through verse 21. It says this, but the disciples had forgotten to bring food. So, so go back. It said, it said after Jesus had said, hey, I'm not going to give you such a sign. This generation cannot expect to see that sign. In verse 13, he said, so he got back into the boat and left them and he crossed to the other side of the lake. Verse 14 then says, but the disciples had forgotten to bring any food. So, so they had forgotten to bring any food. They were hungry. They had been with Jesus all day. They had been, you know, traveling with him. They had been, been kind of in this work with him. And they realized that they had forgotten to bring food with them in the boat. Um, and it said that they only had one loaf of bread with them at the time. Verse 15, as they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, watch out, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. Now, isn't, I want to start out by saying, isn't this just like Jesus? You forget the food, you realize that you are in, you have physical hunger, and he responds and says, whoa. Watch out and beware of the yeast of the Pharisees because he, you have one loaf of bread and he, now he's talking about the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. And you can imagine that his disciples, even at this point, were like, what is he even talking about, right? Let's go on. Verse 16, at this, they began to argue with each other because they, had, because they hadn't brought any bread. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, why are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all? For those who are just joining us, we are in Mark chapter 8. Um, we are reading between verses 14 and 21. I know that I've seen a couple new ones. Hello, Kathy. Hello, Jill. Um, I hope that you didn't lose me. Jill says, I lost you. I'm still here. I see live. I see eight in the stream. So I'm going to, I'm going to go on like I am doing okay. Um, so we're at, um, so let's back up a minute. Verse 16. Now the band of brothers, these disciples are saying, oh my goodness we didn't bring bread and they're arguing between who hadn't brought it. Well, you said that you would bring it. I said, no, you, you said that you had it. Remember you said you packed it and you didn't and, and all of that. And so they're, they're passing around this blame blame game and they're arguing about not having any bread. So they're arguing about a trivial condition, a trivial thing as bread. And Jesus is saying to them, why are you arguing about having no bread? Like, there are bigger fish to fry here. Like, why is it that you are focused on something that doesn't even 
mean anything that doesn't even matter in the big scheme of things. So he says, why are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you yet understand? Don't you yet get it? Don't you know or understand even yet? So even after all that they had been through together, even after they had traveled miles with Jesus, and even though they had seen him do the miracle work that they had done up to this point, he is saying to them, are your hearts too hard to take it in? Don't you understand it? He says in verse 18, you have eyes to see. You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all? Verse 19, he says, when I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread, how many baskets of leftovers did you pick up afterward? Twelve, they said. Verse 20 says, and when I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves, how many baskets were left over? Seven, they said. Don't you understand that? He said to them. So this is the story of Jesus warning the disciples for the dullness of their hearts. For the dullness who, who did not see, who could not hear, and would not understand. And they were in that condition because of the hardness of their hearts. And there are some things that I through through reading this and just in, in some studying in my commentary that Jesus was, he was astonished and wounded. It's like he's saying here, you've been with me. You've been privy to all of the things that I have done, all of the things that I have said. You've been a witness to my character. You've been a witness to how I've reacted during situations and you still can't see. You still don't hear and you don't understand. And so I'm feeling like Jesus is astonished and there's a woundedness about him when he hears this because these guys had a front row seat. Jesus didn't let everyone in. He chose a few men in which to share his life with. And they still didn't get it. I believe that he was astonished and he was wounded. I believe that he was grieved and he was pained in this situation. That there was a grievance about it. That there was a pain about it. As, as moms, I'm sure that many of you can relate that when you, when you spend a lot of time trying to teach a child something and they don't get it or they can't get it or they can't understand and you've told them over and over and over again and you've taught that thing and you've, you know that they should be behaving better and they don't, there is this dissatisfaction. There is this grievance that we have. There is this pain. We take that on as the adult, as the parent, and we say, it hurts us. And I believe that what we also see is this anger within Jesus, this disappointment in his men, this disappointment and this displeasure. He wondered at the lack of their ability to see. At the beginning of this, I asked the question, can we see Jesus in the messy conditions of our world? I think it's the most important question that we need to be asking ourselves. Can we see Jesus? Is he the thing that we choose to see, that we choose to focus on when everything seems in chaos and out of control? Skip with me for a minute, if you would, to John 14, 9. I want to kind of tie this in because I believe that this is another place that we see Jesus acting as though he is astonished and wounded, grieved, pained, angered, and displeased. In John chapter 14, verse 9, actually, if, you, if we back up a little bit, we just talked about how the Pharisees were looking for a sign. They were looking for uh, something to prove that the one that Jesus claimed to be was actually the one. We, we also saw it in John the Baptist, the one that, that should have known for sure that this was Jesus. Because you remember that John the Baptist, as he was in his mom Elizabeth's womb, when Elizabeth met with her cousin Mary, who was also pregnant with Jesus at the time, it says in Scripture that the baby John actually leapt at the, at the feeling that the Lord Jesus was present. 
Even John the Baptist, when he was in prison, asked his disciples to go ask Jesus, is this the Messiah that we've been waiting for? Or should we wait for somebody else? And we see it again happening here with, with Philip, just like we saw with John the Baptist, just like we saw from the crazed out Philistines, or I'm sorry, Pharisees. We see it happening in, four, in John chapter 14, verse 8. It says, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. He was looking for a sign. Philip says, you show. And Jesus says, no, I need you to believe. Jesus responds with this in verse 9. It says, Jesus replied, have I been with you all the time, Philip? And yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Why are you asking me to show you, show him to you? Philip says, you show, Jesus says, I need you to believe. So much of us uh, right now, I believe so many of us are saying, God, where are you in this mess? We need a sign that you're here. And Jesus says, I've never left. Maybe you've just lost your eyesight. Maybe you've just lost your ability to find me because the condition, the, the danger, the fear, the anxiety, the depression, the sadness, the worry has all blocked view of who I am. I love that Jesus replied, have I not been with you the whole time? And I love, I read a commentary about this specific verse. It says that when he, he seldom used direct names in talking to his disciples. And here he says the name of Philip. Have I been with you the whole time, Philip? Haven't I been here? There's, there's something that, that when he does this, there's this deep affection in the designation of the name. Philip says, I just need to see you. And Jesus says, you just need to open your eyes. The world says that I will believe it when I see it. In the kingdom world, it's believing and then seeing. I love this story about Philip because I feel like that has been me so many times in my life. It was his disciples after all, that I feel had pained him the most. And isn't that the truth, that so many times that those who are closest to us or those who are closest to us are the ones that we tend to hurt the most? I don't know why that is, but it does seem to be that way. I love going back to this, this passage in Mark. There are so many things I feel like that are happening here. Jesus is rapidly and repeating these questions to his disciples. And I picture him, him saying these and asking these at rapid place and repeating them. Why are you arguing? Don't you yet understand? Are your hearts too hard? Can't you see? Don't you remember? There's something so passionate about the way that he's asking them in this succession like this and in this repeated pattern. Why are you arguing? Don't you get it? Haven't you been with me all along? Don't you see that I've never left your situation? Can't you see? Don't you remember? I did a study on this long time ago and I talked about how sometimes it is so hard to see and sometimes it is so hard to hear. It's hard to see because we are faced with a world right now that our, our senses are so heightened to all of the news and all of the, the social media platforms and all of the loud voices that are taking place in our, in, our, in our world today. Everybody has an opinion and everybody feels that they have a platform to vocalize that opinion. And so the world right now is in chaos. The world right now is lost. The world right now is in a condition that we have never seen it in. The world is crazed right now. And yet we have Jesus in print 
saying the same thing to you and to me today. Don't you understand yet? Are your hearts too hard? Can't you see? Don't you remember? I feel like Jesus is saying in this moment, I know that it's hard to see. I know that the, that, the, that the vision has been blurred by all of the other nonsense that we are seeing in our world today. And I know that you can't hear a lot because there is so much noise. But if you can't see and you can't hear, I need you to remember. I need you to go back and remember the things that you have seen. Remember the things that you have heard. I've said this in almost every live since April, that our pattern is Jesus, that he is the one that we are to emulate. He is the one that left us with a model, a standard in which to live by. Jesus only did what he saw the Father do, and he only said what he heard the Father say. And yet one look around, even in the Christian culture today, we are not seeing the Jesus that is in my Bible lived out, the Jesus in print lived out in person, magnified for other people to see. It's just not what we're seeing. I was talking uh, to a friend of mine the other day, and I was telling her um, and just kind of just sharing my heart with you tonight. I was just being really honest with her, and I said, uh, we were on the phone a couple weeks ago and I was, I was kind of in tears about a certain subject that we were talking about. We tend to really get in these deep conversations. We only talk maybe once on the phone, maybe once every month. And when we do, it's a good couple hour long conversation. And I was talking with her and I was kind of sharing my heart with her as I'm going to share with you tonight. And I was just telling her that I'm a little lost right now. And I don't believe that I'm the only one feeling this way. I think that there would be many that would say that same thing, that we're just feeling a little lost, um, that we, we, we we're kind of feeling a little unsettled. That's at least how I'm feeling, um, that I, I have great desire to do things. I have um, great goals that I want to set for myself, and yet there are some days that it's just hard to get motivated to do anything. I think that part of it is just the condition of the world that we live in, that we don't know what's happening from day to day, that we don't have a lot of solid truths to hold on to, that, that maybe there is just some, some, so much craziness going on in the world that we really feel unstable. And, um, you know, raise a hand in the sidebar to let me know I am not the only one that's feeling this way because I, I feel that I'm not. Um, but I just feel have felt a little loss, like maybe a little loss of purpose lately. Um, maybe that, you know, I'm just, I've just kind of been struggling in my heart of hearts, if I'm being honest with you. Um, again, just so many things that I want to do, so many things that I aspire to want to want to start. And, and yet I'm finding myself not having a lot of um not a lot of direction. And I've been very prayerful about that lately in my life. And, um, but it's just been, I, I'm just being honest. It's been very uh, like a challenging time. And yet my friend told me something that I won't soon forget. Um, she said to me this, she said, God has gifted you. And I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. God has gifted you with the ability to see differently. Don't ever forget that you have the gift of seeing differently. And I, I kind of stopped for a minute and it really um, got me thinking about that. And I, I, I know exactly what she means. Now, for a very long time, I have been a writer. I love to write. Um, and I never seem to be without content. I'm, I'm always talking about that. I just talked about that this morning or uh, earlier in tonight's live. It feels like it was this morning, right? In tonight's live, I, I talked about that, um, about how um, I've been a writer. I've never been without content. I always feel like I have things to write about. In fact, I have on my phone a list that I have started, uh, that I had started like a year ago of all of the subject, uh, the, the topics that I kind of want to write about. Um, but it never fails that God will show me something in a picture in a situation happening, in a world event of, of something that I want to write about. And so I will try and always capture it with my phone and then put a note that I want to write about that later. And I feel like it is a gift that God has given me the ability to see. 
the ability to see him in all things. I'll give you an example. I was telling my friend about that, which is what started this conversation. Um, I was talking about the oddest thing happened to me a couple weeks before my daughter got married. In Back in July, I was cleaning out our... Um, uh, garage and I was sweeping out our garage and you know I was just sweeping not really paying attention to to life you know just kind of sweeping away mundane job and I looked down and I saw two small ants and um, I don't know why normally I would just be like uh, ant got to get rid of them you know kill them let them let them you know sweep them up and get rid of them and something in me told me to get down closer to examine what was going on with these two ants. Now, I know this is crazy. I'm, I'm funny like this, um, but this is how God speaks to me. And so I, I get down on my hands and knees. In fact, at one point, my husband came out and he's like, what are you doing? What are you even looking at? I'm like, shh, as if like the ants were going to be disturbed by my conversation with my husband. I'm like, shh, you know, I'm looking at these ants. And he's like, what's going on? And the strangest thing that I was observing right before my very eyes was an ant with another ant that he was carrying, it looked like, on his shoulder. I, I, I can't make this stuff up. This is legit what was happening. And I'm like, what is going on? Well, then I realized that the ant that he was carrying wasn't moving. So my assumption was that the ant had died and that his friend was carrying the dead ant to his colony or to, you know, back to his home or to bury him, I don't know. But I found it so fascinating that these little teeny creatures were engaging in this significant act, regardless if it was just carrying his friend or whether it was that he was, you know, gonna have him for dinner later that night. I mean, I don't know what ants do, right? But I'm like, what in the world? And so I get down and I snap a picture of this and right away God shows me this vision, kind of this, this vision in story form that this was, that I was experiencing such a compassion in even the smallest of creatures. And one of the things that I'm constantly saying is that you and I are only, we're, we're just carrying, you know, we're just walking each other home is what I've always said, right? We're just walking each other home. That really at the end of the day, you and I, we, we were meant to engage with one another. We were meant to be in a relationship with one another. That's why this quarantine pandemic, that's why this situation has been so difficult because you and I crave human contact, right? And so what we saw, what I witnessed, in these ants was the same thing that there was this connection there was this compassion one friend to another carrying their 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 deceased one back to their colony so they could bury them it was so interesting that even I, I watched him go from one side of our garage to the other side of the garage I watched him make his way and he would go so far stop and I'm not even exaggerating. He would look up and he would do this number and he would then put him back on his shoulder or back or arm or whatever he was doing and continue on, put him back down and then do this motion again with his arms and then continue on. And it was crazy. It was almost like we were watching him mourning or wailing or crying out. Maybe he was calling his other aunt friends. I don't know. But this is the way that God speaks to me. And why is that? It's because I insist on being aware of the presence of God in my life. Now, yes, he can even speak through ants. And I know that sounds really weird. I know that is that makes me probably a real nerd, but this is how God speaks. And so whenever stuff like that happens, I, I make sure that I pay attention. I take a second, I snap the picture, I make a mental note of what God kind of downloaded to me in that moment, and I want, I make a note to write about that at a later time. And if you've been following me on my page for very long or Inspire, you will see many of these lived out in the writings that I prepare for on a regular basis. I see things differently. And I don't do that, I don't say that to brag to you because I see and you don't, or because I have this amazing vision and you don't, or that God prefers me over you and so he has given me this great ability. I'm saying that it's a gift and that it is one of those gifts that even at that time that my friend said that to me, I needed that encouragement. 
uh, in a season of time that's been difficult and challenging for me, you wouldn't know it, but it has been a very difficult and challenging season for me. Um, I needed to hear that. I needed to be reminded that, Wendy, God has gifted you with the ability to see differently. And what I want to say to you today is we can pray to have eyes that see Jesus and only Jesus, even in the midst of of a pandemic. It's simple as praying for it. God, I want to be able to see. I want to be able to hear. I want to be able to remember. I don't want to be like the Pharisees. I don't want to be like Philip who says, give me a sign only to be corrected by Jesus to say, heaven, I've been with you all the time. I've never left. It's not me that's hidden myself from you. It's you that is hidden from me. It's you that, have, that are refusing to see. You and I, we can be trained to see the way that Jesus sees. We have to practice seeing Jesus in all things. And it is a practice. I didn't wake up one day and just have this great ability to see. I was prayerful every single day. I remember when I really started getting serious about my walk with Jesus. It was the year 2010. I had just left my ministry job at a church that I loved dearly. And I loved the position like none other that I had had up to that point. And when I left my position, I thought, what on earth am I going to do now with my life? And I remember thinking, God, I felt, I felt so far away from him at that moment. And I remember praying, God, give me eyes to see the way that you see. I prayed that before I ever was familiar with this story in scripture. I started to pray, God, be that for me. I want to have a passion for your word. I want to have a passion in my relationship with you. And I want to be able to see you. I want to be able to know you. I want to be able to hear you. And that prayer has been what has sustained me for the last 10 years. That prayer has been what has been able to get me through a pandemic by saying, I am refusing to see any work of the enemy in this. I am focusing solely on Jesus. But we have to practice seeing Jesus in all things. And so maybe that is a prayer that you and I begin to pray. God, help me to see things the way that you see them. Give me eyes to see. Give me ears to hear. Give me comprehension to understand what it is that you're trying to tell me. We have to practice seeing Jesus in all things. We have to be sensitive to his leading we have to be sensitive. Where is he telling us to go? What is it that he's telling us to do? What are the directives that we are doing? Jesus only did what he saw the Father do. He only said what he heard the Father say. As much as he was God, and he was 100% God, he was also 100% man, which means that he limited his capacity. He limited his ability to only what the Father did and said. He could have done a lot more, but he limited himself as a human man in human form to do only that which he saw, the father do and only spoke words that he heard the father say. And that is our call on our life. We have to be sensitive to his leading. We have to ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You and I have to get to a point where we're like, we cannot do this on our own. We cannot make it through a pandemic. We cannot make it through a crazy election year where everybody hates everybody because somebody has an opinion. We cannot make it through without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us. And we learn by experience. We train. It's training our eyesight to see. There is this amazing story that I read about during one of my commentaries through this particular passage. It talked about, and this is just amazing to me, it talked about how there are these fishes in the northern part of America. So in the northern part of the states, there are these fishes that live in caverns. And they have lived 
in these caverns for so long, for so many years, there's this generation of fish that have lived in these dark caverns for so long in underground, in these underground channels that the present generation, so the ones that are the next generation of fish that came up after these, these fish that had lived so long in the dark, the present generation of them have been actually born, get this, without eyes altogether. The generation before them proved that eyesight was actually useless because they had simply lived too long in a condition where sight was not an exercised sense. That is just fascinating. What that means is that there, were this, there was this initial group of fish that lived in these underground channels in these dark caverns. And they had maneuvered through life under these dark caverns for so long that they had conditioned themselves to the darkness and that their offspring actually were born without eyes because they were a useless form of sense. They didn't use that form of sense at all. They didn't use eyes to see at all. So I want to pose this question, could it be that you and I have lived in darkness for so long now that we no longer have eyes to see? Have we conditioned ourselves for, for so long in the darkness that dark is all we see? The dark is all we see. I used to have Bible studies we did, you know, through our time with, um, with uh, Inspire Ministries, we've had so many Bible studies. I think when I counted it last, we had like, we'd done like 16 Bible studies over the course of seven years. And during those Bible studies, week after week after week, we would meet on Thursday nights. And one of the things that I would always be, that I was pretty much conditioned actually to, um, to start the night out with. Um, I always kind of wanted to break the ice. I wanted to, you know, start out with a question that everybody could engage in. And one of the questions that I would always start out with is this. I would always say, tell me something good. And I would go around the room and I'd be like, does anybody have anything good that they want to share? And I cannot tell you how sad I was on so many occasions to receive absolutely zero feedback. I would say, tell me something good, and they couldn't, they couldn't do it. They couldn't tell me anything good. Why? Because we have conditioned ourselves to see only darkness. Now, if I had started the night out by saying, tell me something bad going on, if I would have opened up tonight's live session with, tell me something evil, tell me something bad, tell me something that's ugly in the world, I would bet that many of us, me included, would not have a difficult time coming up with something to say. In fact, I bet you it would roll off of us like that very easily. But it was very sad to see that we have conditioned ourselves to the point where we don't often see the good over the evil. I want to share something with you that I shared um, I, I shared here on our Journaling with Jesus page last week. I had wrote about it also on our Inspire Ministries page, and it's been something that has been wrestling in my spirit ever since this pandemic started in March. My thought about this pandemic that we are seeing now, this COVID-19 pandemic, is, is one that may be different than any one that you've ever heard. Um, and I don't know that I have uh, real authority to speak on this. I certainly don't claim to be an expert in theological discussions. I'm just a girl who loves Jesus. I'm just a girl who loves his word. I'm in it every single day. And I, I just love Jesus. And I really want other people to love the word and love him. I do. Um, and I want them to get to experience Jesus at a level that I've been able to experience him. So I'm not coming to you with necessary, necessarily real authority to be able to say this, but it is my personal conviction that what we are seeing is not a work of the enemy, but a work of God. 
Again, I have no real authority to claim this, nor do I have any argument that I feel like I want to try to debate this issue on. But I am going to say it here because this is a safe community. And this is a place that I feel like we can share ideas and we can share what God is speaking to us about. and We can share what's on our heart. And that is really the heart that I have behind even this, this entire platform in and of itself. But I don't think everything that we are seeing happening in our world today is straight from the enemy. Now, I don't mean to say that it's not I don't mean to say that the result of what we're seeing played out is not from the enemy, because I think the result of what we are experiencing in the world, meaning our reaction to things or the secondary effects that are happening as a result of poor choices or, or negative attitudes, all of those serve as a result of what's happening. I'm not saying that those do not come from the enemy. And note that I cautiously use the words, not all that we are seeing in my original comment, but I simply think that oftentimes we give the enemy far more credit than he deserves. Now hear me out with this. He's crafty. I'll give him that. He's cunning. He's manipulative. He is. Isaiah chapter 21, verse 2, it says that he is the betrayer betraying and the destroyer destroying. So there is no doubt that what we are seeing in part, especially the result of what's happening, is in part directed by the destroyer and the betrayer. He's really not that smart. He doesn't really have as much control over the condition of our environment as we have given him credit for. And if we honestly read through the scriptures, if we open up our Bibles and we get very seriously about reading the Bible and the hard stories that come from the prophets that lived long ago, we are compelled to think differently about a world where consequences from sin are real. It's it's very hard to not look at Zechariah, to not look at Hosea, to not look at books like Nahum and say, you know what? This was predicted by those long ago because the sin life has gotten out of control. Because we have lost our vision of who Jesus is. We have failed to see, we have failed to hear, and we have failed to understand. Either way, I think that through all of this, we can all agree on one thing, and that is the Lord is getting our attention. In one way, shape, or form, he's getting my attention, for sure. Since this pandemic started, I have been doing so much research through the Old Testament, right from Genesis all the way to to Zechariah, where it talks about all that is happening is been foretold. All of this is a result of walking away from the Lord. He's getting our attention. I was reading in Matthew 14, verse 27 the other day, And it's this story that we're so familiar with. It's Jesus walking on the water. And it's his disciples in a boat and they see him. He's walking on the water and they actually fear that he is a ghost. That's very interesting to me. Now, I had never really given it much thought until this pandemic. But when you think about it, when they see Jesus, someone that they should be very familiar with in bodily form, in vocal, audible voice, in all of the things about his countenance that should have been easily distinguished among anybody else, they see him walking on the water and they think he's a ghost. That's very interesting to me. Maybe you and I see what's happening around us. Instead of seeing Jesus, we see a ghost. 
instead of seeing the Savior of the world trying desperately to give us a chance, trying desperately to call out to the remnant that he has designed for a plan and a purpose, only to be so fearful that it's not him because we have not conditioned ourselves, we have not trained ourselves to see him. We've actually conditioned ourselves for darkness like those fish and the generation that is coming up behind us are not even gonna be, they're not even gonna have eyes to see because of the condition that we have allowed ourselves to remain in for so long. It's a scary reality. But here we find that the disciples are in this boat. They see the Jesus on the water, the one that they were with, the one that they had been privy to, the one that had been their, their, their friend all along, and they think he's a ghost. And I love the Kenneth Wust, Wust I think, W-U-E-S-T, Kenneth Wust translation, where, where Jesus says these words to his terrified disciples. He says, be having courage. It is I. Stop fearing. And he says that with great authority. I absolutely love that. He says, um, be having courage. It is I. Stop fearing. And I heard this in my spirit when I read that. I wept and I said, God, this is the time that I need to repent for the times that I haven't seen you, for the times that I chose, purposefully chose to see the enemy over. I heard it in my spirit. It is I. Stop fearing. I get very, uh, I'm a backseat driver. Uh, those of you who don't know me wouldn't know that. And maybe even some of you that know me well might not know that. But I am a backseat driver and it's gotten worse in my old age. Uh, it was never so um, heightened when than when we were out in California. We had rented a car at San Francisco Airport and we were coming from San Francisco to Dublin, California, where my daughter and her new husband live. And it was about a 30 minute drive. And I just remember as we got on that seven lane freeway, I was gripping my seat. I was fearful for my life. In fact, at one point I, I screamed out, I scared my husband half to death. He didn't know if some animal or child or something had, had come out in front of us. And I was, I was so, I felt so out of control that I actually, my legs actually got up on the seat with me and I like curled up and I, I was fearful. And he laughed at me and he said, I don't know why you're so fearful, but I'm telling you the God's honest truth that something in me goes crazy when we get in that crazy trap. And we are we are crunched in with with a semi on the left and a semi on the right and crazy drivers to my my front and my back and then you've got the motorcycles who are allowed to go in between the lines in California. I mean, who makes these rules up? I do not know. And the truth is that in true Trevor fashion, you know, he he looks at me and he laughs and and he he shares this 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 funny joke about how I'm so scared and I need to get over it, but it's fear and it's real. And when I'm in the moment, I cannot see us on the other side. All I can see is us getting in an accident, us winding up in the hospital, us being delayed for some reason, or us being dead. I mean, literally, it's the it's the fear that I have when I get in that car when someone else is driving. And yet, could that be how we are? a little jumpy at all that's happening around us. I can hear us saying it in the words that we say. I can see it in the way that we post these crazy things on Facebook. And listen, if you think as a Christian that you are okay to post the junk that you're posting, listen, oh, we're not okay. There are so many people who are needing hope in this season. And you and I who are Christ followers, you and I who have Jesus, you and I who have the greatest hope that the world has ever seen are not practicing hope on our personal pages. We are only posting what we are crazily 
fixated on and it's not Jesus. A lot of the time, it's not Jesus. I see things all of the time. I hear things all of the time. And it's this fear. It's like that fear that I had in that seat riding with my husband from San Francisco to Dublin that day. This crazy, irrational fear. I hear us saying these things like, oh my goodness, there are more outbreaks. Did you hear about that? Did you hear the Phoenix cases are on the rise and people are dying left and right? We see it in, in, in posts about our kids going back to school. I have seen actual shaming from one side to the other because people have chosen to either leave their kids home and do distant learning or take their kids into the school to have person contact tra uh, contact teaching. And I've seen it shamed on one side or the other. I've heard moms who pour out their heart and they're like, I just don't know what to do. We've heard it in this fear saying, my kids can't go back to a traditional school and I'm so frightened for them. I'm not sure how they're going to learn. I've heard moms talk about that with their senior in their last year of school, and I get it. Oh, I get it. I get it more than you know. We planned a wedding for my only child during a pandemic, and it was hard, and I'm not going to lie to you. It was difficult. But we hear that in the fear. We hear that, that fearfulness in the voices. We hear things like, I'm so afraid of how this election is going to go down. And if it doesn't go the way that I want it to, boy, this country's in big trouble. We are only demonstrating what world we are most conscious of. The world that the enemy has control of or the kingdom world where Jesus resides. And you and I, we've got to get better. And I put me in that category. This is not shaming anyone. This is not saying that anyone is doing anything wrong. I'm lumping myself into that. I just told a story about being fearful. Listen, I can be in my own home. My husband and I are the only two people that live here. And I can have my husband be in one room. I'm in the next. I know he's in the other room. And he can just come walking in when I've got my blow dryer on. And I turn around and I, oh my gosh, you scared the, the heck out of me. I didn't see you coming. And he's like, who did you actually think it would be? You know, like, uh, you know, I, it's just you and I here. Uh, it's early in the morning. Nobody's awake. Like, nobody's breaking in the house. Like, I... I don't know why you were so fearful, but yet we feel this all of the time, this unnecessary, this unrealistic fear. And I'm not even saying that that's wrong. Fear in itself is not wrong, but highlighting the work of the enemy within the fear, that is wrong. Yeah, my mom says how tragic. It's tragic. It is. It's tragic. We are filled with this panic and this fear and this anxiousness. And yet we can look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. And I want to read it to you. You don't have to go to it, but you can write it down for reference. 1 Peter 4, 12, Paul says this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. It is I. Stop fearing. And so we look for Jesus. We look for Jesus in the mess that we're in. We look for him. And many times I've had conversations with friends who say, I can't find Jesus. Keep looking. He's there. He's never left. He says, have courage. Take courage. Be having courage. It is I. Stop fearing. And so we look for Jesus. We look for Jesus because he's here. He's there. Look, it's him. We need not be afraid. He still has the whole world in the palm of his hands. Doesn't matter if the election goes the way that you want it to. Jesus is still in control. Doesn't matter if we have no vaccination by the end of the year. He still has the whole world in the palm of his hands. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter if you have been a good mom and you chose to send your child to the, the, the school environment because that is the best choice that you made for you and your family. Be well in knowing that the Lord is going with you and he is saying, do not fear. It is I. Stop fearing. 
We are still protected. We are still loved. We are still provided for ways that we can't even imagine. And yes, even from the invisible enemy. Satan doesn't get credit after all. He doesn't get credit. You and I give him credit all of the time. We give him credit when we insist on remaining fearful. When we insist on staying in a ridiculous cycle of anxiety. When we, when we, when we stop praying. When we stop reaching for his hand. When we stop looking for him in the crowd. It was so interesting. You know, I saw Jesus in my little shorky at the wedding for my daughter. We had decided, I think I might have told this story before, but we had decided that we were just going to let her free to roam about during the wedding because there was no use trying to contain her. She was going to go where she wanted to go, and nobody really wanted to be in control of Isabel on that day. But it was so interesting to watch her meander through the crowd, and as she went from row to row, she would do one of these, and she'd look up, and she'd go to the next person, and she'd look up. What was she doing? She was looking for me. She was looking for Mama. She was looking for that familiar face. And I picture that you and I are the same way. We're in this chaos. We're in this, this crazed world. It's time to look up. Where is it that Jesus is in the mess? Where is he standing in our circumstance? Where is he in the place of, of this uncertainty where I can feel safe again? We need to look for him. Because after all, you and I, like those fish, right? Those fish that were in those caverns in the dark, we risk passing on to the next generation, a generation born with no eyes, where they have no vision, they cannot see. Because we, you and I, have conditioned ourselves to look only in the dark. We have conditioned ourselves to only be focused on that which is going wrong, that which isn't going our way. We need to refocus. We need to refixate. What are we paying attention to? Now, part of why I, I believe this is possible, I started this all with saying that I, I really don't have much authority on which to base this. I don't really have any, uh, any true theological training, right, to back up my thought process on the fact that this all is not happening from the enemy, that, that we cannot sit and give credit for such a crafty thing on the enemy, that the Lord really is trying to get our attention through this pandemic. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, if you don't, you can just reference this. It's a story that we're all familiar with. Matthew 4, 1 through 11, is the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. I want to I want to take a look just right through it. I'm just going to read um, I'm just going to read verses 1 through 11 and I want to stop and I want to talk about three specific things after I'm done. But this is why I feel that the, the times that we're in, the conditions of the world is not all coming directly from the enemy. And I want to show you where I believe that I get this theory from. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 says this, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that is strictly from Deuteronomy 8.3. So he's quoting scripture back to the devil. It says in verse 5, Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. And he said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with your hands so you won't even hurt hurt so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone so just like we saw jesus reciting scripture to the devil now the devil is reciting scripture to jesus he's like hey well i know scripture too which he did that was from psalm 91 11 through 12. to that jesus responded with more scripture he says the scripture also say you must not test the lord your god this comes from deuteronomy 6 16. so again he's counteracting with scripture 
Verse 8, it says, next the devil took him to the peak of the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give all of this to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Verse 10, it says, get out of here, Satan. Jesus told him, for the scriptures say, you must not worship the Lord your God and serve, I'm sorry, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And that's from Deuteronomy 6.3. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. Now, why is this so important? When we think about giving credit to the devil, giving credit to evil for what we're seeing in the world today. I want to prove to you that that may not be what we're experiencing. Look in verse 1 of what we just read in Matthew 4. It says, then, now if you are one that circles or writes or draws or highlights or anything in your Bible, I want you to circle the word then. Jesus was, and I want you to put a box around, led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Verse 1 says, he was led by the Spirit. Where? Into the wilderness. For what? To be tempted. The Spirit is who led Jesus in to be tempted. Very familiar with what's going on today. Led by the Spirit, he was tempted. And then in verse 4, let's go back to verse 4. It says, but Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This counters truth and knowledge with authority and power. God was backing up words that would prove who he was and that he did, in fact, have authority as one who is speaking on behalf of the Lord himself. We see three things happening here. The devil attacks with physical weakness, that's hunger. The devil mocks his godly power, that's protection. And the devil promises promotion for personal gain, that's power and control. But what we see here is a reaction that Jesus had to the situation that was happening to him. Jesus never lived in reaction to the devil. He never modeled a reactionary attitude. He only lived in response to the Father. And that's what I am begging us as believers to do today. That's what I believe that Jesus is begging for his followers to do in the crisis that we find ourselves in today. Jesus never, ever responded, or I'm sorry, reacted to the devil. He never said, man, I can't believe this is happening. Man, I told you you shouldn't do that. Man, this is awful. Man, this isn't fair. Jesus, I, you know, never said, man, I am fearful of what's happening because it feels like you have a lot of control over this situation. And how dare the spirit lead me into this temptation, knowing who I am and the strength that I have and what, what I could actually do in the snap of a finger to change the condition of my environment. Jesus never lived in reaction to evil. He lived in response to the father. And that's the way that you and I must live, the way we must behave in this day and age that we're living in. When we live more aware of the ugliness in the world, we are actually living unaware of the goodness of God. One is real and one is more real. Is evil real in the world? Absolutely. There's no doubt about it that the enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy. There's no doubt about it that we are promised persecution as believers. There is no doubt that hardship is to follow us and that the suffering of Christ is a real deal. There is absolutely no denying the fact that there is evil in the world. That's real. But there is a truth that is more real 
than that. And that is the awareness of the goodness of the Lord. And you and I need to live in the awareness that the goodness of the Lord outweighs everything negative that is happening in our world today. I love the fact that Jesus, on the night of his arrest in the garden, in the garden of Gethsemane, when the soldiers had come to arrest Jesus, we find one of the disciples who was like, "Uh uh-uh, not happening. I have control of the situation. It was Peter. And scripture tells us that he took a sword and actually seared off the ear of one of the soldiers. He cut off the ear of one of the soldiers. And upon getting his sword out, Jesus says to him in John 18, 11, put the sword away. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. Put the sword away. And we see a lot of swords out right now. We see a lot of swords that are aimed at damaging other people. We see it in the way that we talk about politicalness of the political stuff. We see it in the news. We see it in the riots and we see it in the pandemic. We see it at shaming parents for making certain decisions regarding their school, their school aged children. Um, we, we see a lot of this happening right now, and I believe Jesus is telling Peter, and he tells it to us as well, it's time to put the sword away. We, if we live by the sword, we die by the sword. How we choose to live is how we must choose then to die. Put the sword away. When will we stop fighting, even in the name of Jesus? Because it simply isn't the way that Jesus modeled a lifestyle for you and I to emulate. I'll turn, if you would, one last place that I want to go to in Scripture before I wrap up. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And I, I hope that all of this is making sense. I feel like in my head it does, but oftentimes when I come here and I, I try to I try to communicate it. I feel like sometimes it just comes out a jarbled mess. So I, I forgive me if it is doing that. I, I pray that it's not. But I want you to go to 2 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 4. This was my study this morning. It says this, and I'm going to back up to verse 3. It says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. And it's talking about this, in my commentary, it was talking about this defensiveness, this defensiveness that we have, this argumentative that we argumentative attitude that we have. And I'm trying to find it on, on Instagram today. I had talked a little bit about that. I shared this on my story. I'd love for you to go over and check it out. But but my commentary says this. It says the principal reason, and this is so interesting, it says in regard to second second Corinthians 10 4 that we just read about using God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning. It says this in my um, commentary. It says, the principal reason why the gospel has not made more progress in the world is this. We have contended ourselves, contended ourselves with a defensive rather than an aggressive warfare. What are we doing? Defending the outworks, showing our dexterity and distinguishing nice points and sometimes wounding a fellow soldier, perhaps because his attire, his worldview, his political stance, etc. differs from our own. This we have, this we have done instead of unify, uh, I'm sorry, instead of united in one broad army against the common foe, we have been defensive and not aggressive. Let's look at those two words. The word defensive actually means serving to defend, being protective, made or carried on for the purpose of resisting attack, rejecting criticisms of oneself, 
or covering up one's findings. That's the way that we behave. We, we come with this defensive attitude. But in my commentary, it's saying that we need to instead have an aggressive behavior. What does the word aggressive mean? It means this. It's very interesting. It's militantly forward, vigorously energetic, and it's emphasizing maximum growth. We have targeted the wrong enemy. Ephesians 6.12 says, Our fight is not against flesh and blood enemies, but against the rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. It is this defensiveness over aggressiveness that we have decided upon in this season of time. We have to begin seeing Jesus in the conditions around us. We have to begin at least asking, where are you in this mess? Where are you in this? Because I know that I am not going to give all of the credit to Satan for all that we're seeing in the world. God, if you are attempting to get our attention, God, here I am. I want you in full view. I want to see only you. I don't want to see anybody else. I don't want to see the media. I don't want to see all of this negativity surrounding our election and our president. I don't want to I don't want to see all of the negative things about the pandemic. I don't want to be so conditioned to see darkness that I failed to see you. And going back to our original text in Mark 8, I don't want to be like the Pharisees who demanded to see a sign only to refuse to open up their eyes and see the thing that was in front of them the entire time. I heard this recently, and I've been really thinking about that. It says this fear will always attract whatever information is needed to legitimize its existence. Our approach to a crisis has got to be different. We must begin asking for Jesus to give us eyes that see the way that he sees. And we must condition ourselves Plan on seeing only that which he sees and then saying only what he is saying and, 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 and focusing on only what he's focusing on so that we can do only that which he is doing. And listen, it is, it is time that we, we begin to open up our eyes and look for where is Jesus in this mess. He's here. He's never left. He's not a ghost out on the water. He is a friend who has been there with us the entire time. My approach to a problem, it often reflects the world that I'm most aware of. My reaction to the problem, it really demonstrates what world that I'm focused on, this world or the next world. This transitionary home or my permanent home, which is in heaven. The world that is overrun by Satan or the kingdom realm that Jesus died for me and you to have access to today. Not a time that we wait for the future, but today that we can begin living with kingdom realities today. That Jesus is bigger. That there are two truths. Absolutely, is there evil and is there, is there the power of Satan in this world? Absolutely. But the world that I, am in, uh, that I am insisting on looking at and keeping in constant view is a kingdom reality world that says that Jesus is still the one in control. And that he is still the one that loves and forgives and he still has goodness that the entire world that is searching for hope needs to hear through the life of me and through the life of you. We are the hope dealers in the world. Will we do the job of carrying the hope that this world so desperately needs? Or are we just contributing to the noise? Are we just contributing to the negativity that we're seeing around us. I heard Bill Johnson of Bethel Church say this in a message recently, and I've adapted it in my life. I've, I've written it down. I have ingrained it in my mind. 
He said, the Lord is allowing you and I to be exposed to the chaos so that we will make no mistake in recognizing peace. Not so that we walk around in this victim mentality. Stop. We have a God. We have Jesus who died on the cross for you and I to have access to the greatest message of hope that people are dying without. How are we carrying that hope to the world? You and I are being allowed to be in a season of time that some of the great greats were never privy to. You and I are, are, are being conditioned to see Jesus in a world that's gone mad. And there is somebody, listen, I promise you that there is somebody in your sphere that needs to hear that he has not left, that he is still there, and that he still has the whole world in the palm of his hands. And maybe it was you. Maybe you needed to be reminded of that today. But now that you know, you can be a hope dealer. You can go out and you can change the world with the hope of Jesus. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Lord, give us eyes to see the way that you see. Help us to see you even in the small thing like the ant, even in a sunset, even in a pandemic, even in a crisis, even in a crazy election year where everybody wants to argue, where everybody wants to demonstrate hate, even from the Christian party. I love you all. I thank you so much for being with me tonight. I thank you for a message that's been on my heart, for listening to a message that's been on my heart, a message that continues to be on my heart, one that I have not, that I have not uh, necessarily, um, I'm not necessarily an expert in, but one that I am insistent upon being a student in every single day. Jesus, give me eyes to see the way that you see. I no longer want to be filled with fear. I no longer want to have anxiety. I no longer by, want to be ruled by my reaction to darkness. I want to live in response to the Father. Thank you so much for being with me. Let me pray before we leave tonight. We've been an hour and a half, and for those of you who have stayed the course, I thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you for tonight. Father, I thank you for this place that you have allowed us, a safe environment to talk, to discuss, to digress, to, to challenge ourselves, Father God, with the word. I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Father, that every time that we come to it, we learn. We learn more about your character, Jesus, more about your love, more about your goodness. The more that we learn about you, the more we realize that you have given us this distinct model for which we are to, to seek to emulate. And so, Father God, I just pray for every single person that is listening tonight. Father, I pray for their heart. I pray, Father God, for a transformation in their heart. I pray, Father God, for a transformation in attitudes. I pray, Father God, that we can wake up tomorrow refreshed and renewed and recharged and re-energized, Father. I pray, Father God, that we would begin to see the way that you see, Father God, that we would be, begin tomorrow to begin not reacting to the enemy and the work that we insist that he's doing, but that we would live in response to what we have read in this word, that we would begin to that we would begin to live out in response to what it is that you have said and what it is that you have done, nothing more and nothing less. Father, we love you and we, we thank you for this opportunity to go live tonight. We thank you that the stream went solid and we didn't have to stop and we weren't interrupted. I thank you, Father God, for these precious people who have joined. And I pray, Father God, that you would help us as we move forward, that we would be challenged in, in our thought process and our attitudes to look more like Jesus every single day. We love you and it's in your name, in your name alone that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being with me. I thank you for being a part of this community. If you know people that need to be inspired, that need to hear what these messages are every single week, I pray that you would encourage them to join the page. It's private. I don't share this on any other platform except for this one. And again, I just thank you for being a part of it. I love you and I will see you later. Have a terrific, terrific night. Bye.